There we go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me. You'll have to excuse me. I'm having camera problems tonight. I'm some, having some kind of fog in my camera. That's why you see the weird picture of me up. But I have a real treat for you guys tonight. I mean, this guy, the guy that's on tonight, he really knows his stuff. We're going to be talking to Rob Shelsky, and we're going to be talking about moon mysteries, uh, the Anunnaki and ancient aliens, deadly UFOs, and people disappearing in the Mandela effect. And we were just talking about before the show, we were talking about the simulation theory. So we might even get into that because I have a point, you know, there's a lot of questions with the Mandela effect in general that could go towards that towards the simulation theory. But anyway, a little bit about Rob. He's an avid and eclectic writer of both fiction and nonfiction and averages about 4,000 words a day. Rob, with a degree in science, has written a large number of factual articles for that former Alien Skin magazine, as well as other magazines, and the author of many books with titles such as For the Moon is Hollow and Aliens Rule the Sky, Shattered Reality the Mandela Effect, Ancient Alien Empire, Megalithia, and deadly UFOs and the disappear. Rob has also been a UFO, uh, MUFON UFO field investigator. So, Rob, thank you for joining me. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. How are you, sir? I'm great, great. Um, it was uh, interesting talking about what we were talking about before the show, and I want to get back into that. But first, I wanted to ask you about your research into the Mandela effect. I, I always find it's a really interesting topic, and I just want to get your thoughts on it because. Um, I'm kind of, I, I mean, I, I don't know why it exists. I mean, I, I heard people talking in other podcasts that Forrest Gump says life was like a box of chocolates, but that's not what it is. It was always life is like a box of chocolates. That's what it always was. And now all of a sudden it changed. What, what, is, what is this going on? And that's, it's not just that. It's hundreds of things, right? Well, it's not just a matter of memory, although there's tons of the examples of memory. Kit Kat hi having a hyphen between the two words and not now. Uh, Jiffy peanut butter, which doesn't exist. There's only Jiff, and, and according to them, only ever was. Ford uh, Motor Company with a little squiggle across the F in Ford. They say they've always had it since 1912, and yet medallions have been struck that show it without it. And they're physical, real evidence. Um, there's, there's two aspects to this. One... A lot of people remember something differently from the way it actually happened. However, when they remember it wrongly, they all tend to remember it wrong the same way. And psychiatrists have said, yes, uh, false memories are real, and these are probably false memories. What psychiatrists can't account for, though, is why when people get it wrong, they all get it wrong the same way. And in their tens and hundreds of thousands, even millions. Just a quick example, a uh, common one that I use a lot. Um, can you name the color chartreuse, what color that is? No, no. Okay, well, it, it's actually a lime green color, chartreuse. Okay. And uh, it, uh, when people get it wrong, they all get it wrong the same way. They say it's a maroon, a reddish purple, a purplish brown. They don't say it's blue. They don't say it's yellow. They don't say it's orange. When they get it wrong, they all get it wrong the same way. And this wow. is common all these false memories, and they, we can't account for why. Now, the Mandela effect was um, started by, um, I, I want to say her name was Fiona Broom. It's been a while since I wrote, wrote the book. And it was back in about 2013 that the term Mandela effect was coined because a lot of people remembered President Mandela of South Africa as having died in prison. I remember that. But he didn't. He was released, and he went on to be president of South Africa before he died of old age. Now, oddly enough, I remember it both ways. I remember hearing he died in prison, and I remember hearing that he was president of South Africa and died of old age at his home, so or at the hospital. But um, I remember so hearing it the first way that he had died a long time ago, you know. And then when I heard that he was alive, that's when it hit me. I said, "Wow, how, that didn't make sense." So uh, that's what made me, you know, like. Uh, I don't think I realized it at that point, you know, I think I actually got into an argument with someone one day about like, was Nelson Mandela really dead or alive? And, and I, you know, like, I mean, look, I interviewed a lady named Cynthia Larson. She's great. She, she studies the Mandela effect too. And she looks into it. And I, I really can't remember a lot from our interview, but do you think we could be experiencing like parallel realities or different timelines merging? Well, there's a lot of explanations. 
<clears throat> excuse me, one is the simulation theory that we're being tinkered with, and so it's changing our past. And not all of us are fully updated to the new version, so some of us remember the older version. There seems to be a lot of um, evidence for the idea that our past or our timeline is being tampered with. Now, is this because of someone deliberately coming from the future and doing it, simulation programmers altering the program, or is it because other timelines are mixing with us? We're not sure. However, it seems odd to me that she came up with the term Mandela effect in 2013, and quantum computers first went online right around 2010, the first very primitive little ones. And immediately after that, people started talking about things being different than they remembered them being. And the thing about quantum computers, and you can check this for yourself, anyone can look it up on the internet. If you go to the internet and you type in D-Wave seminar, the, one of the two founders of D-Wave quantum computers is giving a seminar, and in the seminar he quite explicitly states, and makes no reservations about it, that quantum computers are fast because they access quantum computers in parallel timelines. Yeah, he's, he's, he comes out and says this, flat out. There's absolutely no doubt. And wow. I've heard other, yeah, other scientists say the same thing, that parallel universes that are very like ours would have quantum computers too, and that these quantum computers can actually interact. Because, frankly, quantum computers are just, um, they have qubits, but they're based on probability waves. And there's a lot of evidence to show that probability waves also have to manifest, and that means an infinite number of other parallel universes, the many worlds theory, if you like. So is one of the side effects of, of quantum computing this mixing of our timelines? Are we getting some of the memories embedded in us from another timeline when we access that timeline through a quantum computer? Uh, when they first exploded the atomic bomb, they didn't know what the results would be. There was even a small chance, mathematically speaking, that it could have ignited the atmosphere and burned off the entire atmosphere of Earth. But scientists went ahead and blew it up anyway even though because they said it was such a very small chance. Even so, I don't think I would have done it, you know? But, yeah. uh, but so what are the side effects of quantum computing? Are we messing with timelines here? Are we screwing things up? Or is it people in the future altering the past by going into it? And uh, the other thing it might be is, is it some cosmic programmer who's altering the timeline for our simulation? This we don't know, but it seems odd to me, and I favor the quantum computer theory the most because the two occurred almost simultaneously. Quantum computers came online around 2010, 2011, and by 2013, we're talking about the Mandela effect. And by the way, the Mandela effect isn't just false memories or differing memories. It, it manifests itself in real physical terms. There are all sorts of things that have changed and disappeared in our timeline. Really? Really? Yeah, Oh, absolutely. Australian. I was I lived in Australia as a kid. I'm Australian and American. And oh, when funny. I was a kid Yeah, and when I was a kid in Australia, um they showed uh New Zealand as being roughly parallel and slightly north of center of Australia if you do a line across Australia horizontally. Now New Zealand is a good deal south, um, east of Australia. Also Australia has one island, main island, Tasmania. It's a, one of the states of Australia. But on a lot of globes, in TV shows and movies, oddly enough, the globe shows a landmass immediately to the left of Australia. And in one globe, it's almost uh, one-fifth the size of Australia itself. Now, that landmass doesn't exist, not in our timeline. And yet, on different globes in different movies, some kind of island or landmass does seem to exist off the west, immediate west coast of Australia. This includes the uh, movie Dazed and Confused from, I think, 1994. Two kids are in a classroom spinning a globe. A real classroom was a cheaply made movie. Uh, I don't want to call it a B movie, but it was low budget. And they're spinning a class globe. And on that globe, it shows a landmass immediately to the west of Australia, about one-fifth the size. Uh, in another show, um, uh, Friends, second season, I believe it was called the um, Buddy Bracelet episode. There's a globe in the background in the living room, and if you look at it closely, there's a landmass, smaller one, but there, to the west of Australia, and it also shows Tasmania, so it's not Tasmania misplaced. So I started doing some research, and I found an episode of I Dream of Jeannie, 
And on it, there's a guy who gets a globe stuck on his head. And on the globe, there is a landmass to the west of Australia. There's another large island off the south, the extreme southern tip of South America on the western side of it, complete with mountains and inlets and what even looks like a river on it. This is not a key. This is not a logo or a legend. Wow. It's, a, it's an island. And then it shows another landmass in the Pacific, roughly equal with Central America, and about half the size of Australia. Now, none of these are there. And also in our history, we have a, a history of disappearing islands, some in the South Pacific, some in the Northern Pacific near Russia, um, high Brazil off the coast of um, Ireland, which was on maps for four centuries, suddenly ceased to exist. Now, this is a well-documented island, and it even showed its features, including a strait or a long river that ran horizontally across it, almost segregated, separating the island into two sections. But um, And then there are other islands, even in the Caribbean, that have disappeared, including one that Mexico laid a claim to, to extend its um, economic zone in the ocean so it could have control of the oil there. Well, that island doesn't exist either. And yet multiple sea captains and crews spotted the island and described it and even drew images of it. There's one in um, uh, the, the most recent is uh, Sandy Island in the South Pacific, not too far from Australia. It's been on every map for three centuries. Captain Cook, who discovered Australia, also discovered that island. Other captains, Dutch, Indonesian, have sailed by it, by it noted it. And um, so it's been on charts and maps for three centuries. It was also on a satellite picture of Google Earth. It was pixelated out, but the shape of the island is still there, just blacked out. You can clearly see it. Now it's no longer on Google Earth maps. Now, they usually only get rid of an island or something on, on a Google Earth map if the governments say it's a sensitive um, uh, facility or uh, you know institution that they don't want the public to see or have easy access to viewing like a military base. But the island's gone. They even sent a crew out from Australia to investigate, and the island didn't just sink beneath the waves. The water there is almost 4,000 feet deep. It's as if it was never there at all. And yet map after map of different countries show it as being there, describe it in detail, including Captain Cook. And he's pretty darn famous in history. I can't think of another captain in history, except maybe Magellan or Vasco da Gama, who yeah. is equally famous. Yeah, you know, so. I know Magellan because he encountered giants. I, I, that's how I know. I know that's how I know about Magellan. Magellan's famous for the story for encountering giants. Um, are you familiar with that story? Um, no, I know him from history as having been the um, man who circled the globe. Yeah, he, he, well, he, when he went to when he got to one point, I would have to watch. There's this researcher I watch. His name's Matthew McCroy, and he pointed it out. At one point where they, they landed in, on some remote island, they encountered giants and they had to try to fight them off. It's it's in the history I'm somewhere. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not an expert on it. Um, but it, it, it takes me to our next topic, which were, might have been kind of giants, is the Anunnaki. Your book, um, ancient, it's called Ancient Aliens Megalithia and uh, Ancient Alien Empire Megalithia. Um, and one thing I want to say that before we get into it is uh, about your book is uh, one thing that really irks me about when people, I, I don't know if, you, if you're if you pro Zachariah Sitchin or against, but I, I'm kind of for what he did. You know, I think what he did was a huge pioneering thing in this world. And a lot of people recently have put down his translation saying he got stuff wrong. And I can understand my, he, some people got a couple things wrong. But, but, you know, it's, I'm going to say to people, try to translate cuneiform. It's impossible. But, you know, for I'm being able to come out publicly with the 12th planet in 1976, you know, I mean, there are other translators such as George Smith from the 1800s and Stephanie Dolly, who teaches at Oxford University. They both translated the, the tablets and they all came up with a similar story that, you know, that the Anunnaki existed, that they created us and the most important thing uh, um, that I think those are the most important things that, and, but your book, the ancient alien empire, Megalithia doesn't just go into Anunnaki. It goes into the Vedic text as, as well. Correct. Yes. I, I don't, I never, in my research, I never rely solely on one authority. I don't rely strictly on Plato about Atlantis and I don't, he was the first one to ever write about it. 
and I don't rely strictly on Sitchin, although I think most of his work was pretty well done. Did he make some mistakes? Probably. I'm sure there are mistakes in hieroglyphics by archaeologists as well. But I don't think what he wrote was mistakes with regard to that, because corroborating evidence from the Bible, uh, the Book of Enoch, and others tell us that there were giants on the, on the earth. There were the Nephilim, the Watchers, they supposedly interbred with our woman, and they were a tall race of giants, and they lived a long, long time. The um, Sumerian, uh, going, uh, not, it's the same group as Sitchin was talking about, uh, who, who left this history, they also had a, something called a list of kings. Now, this list of kings referred to there being nine, I think, it was, I think it was nine, again, it's been a while since I wrote the book, nine generations from Adam to uh, the time of the Great Flood. And prior to the Great Flood, these kings could live for 20,000, 12,000, one even lived like, God, 40,000 years, I think it was. But, yeah. um, and then after the Flood, all that changed. And they had normal lifespans. Now, this is interesting because um, it shows a clear demarcation, a time when things changed. And the, the Great Flood seems to be what triggered it. And I think there was an ancient alien empire on Earth. I think we had overlords, if you want, overseers. I think they probably did create the human race, or they um, monkeyed around with us monkeys until we did what they wanted to. They were not well suited for our planet. They um, had to have their um, palaces, we call them temples, and they had their priesthood. Uh, we call them a priesthood. They probably called them servants who waited on them hand and foot and literally fed them and bathed them. But they didn't go out of their temples much, so they had humans created as a more intelligent species to do the mining. Mining was very big to them. They wanted gold. And gold, by the way, is a rare element throughout the universe. It isn't formed by supernovas. It takes two neutron stars colliding, for instance, to create gold. So it's, it's a rare element throughout the universe, so it would be much prized no matter where you were. But um, I think that they did this and they had – a worldwide system that was controlled by them. The Indian Vedic texts refer to the Vimana. These were flying craft of all sorts. And the Vedic texts refer to certain humans being allowed to pilot them. It even goes into the detail where it tells them how to avoid mid-air collisions. Wow. And basic information about how the things worked. Some were quite small, like two-man jobs, and others were as big as small cities. The Vedic text... Um, so if you had a, uh, a colonial power, let's say, of aliens on Earth, and they have control of the Earth, and maybe there's more than one set, and they have control of different areas of the Earth, I don't know. But they have created a culture that builds in stone. And I think the reason they built in stone was because when they left and came back due to relativity, when they were traveling in their spaceships, a century more could pass before they came back. So they built to last. So that's why you see these great stone platforms like Baalbek in uh, Lebanon and um, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. These things are built as platforms for their ships. They're far bigger than any temple ever was required to have. The stones are absolutely huge. We still don't know how the heck people moved them. And uh, I think that there was – but once you destroy that government with its flying craft, once they withdraw – you would have a lot of people isolated on the planet because the Earth was not heavily populated at that time by humans. There were small pockets of people. So if you had small pockets of uh, people of a few thousand each along coastal areas around the world, and all of a sudden your connecting device, which is their Vimana, disappear along with the aliens, suddenly you're left alone and you're completely isolated. You no longer can stay in touch with your neighbors. Does that ring any bells? Should. Sounds a bit like the um, results of the Tower of Babel. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And now, do you think also, this... Oh, oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, also the Vedic texts and, uh, and the uh, Sumerian cuneiform also refer to a great war. Now, the Vedic texts go further. They say the war was not only on Earth, but in space, and involves over... Uh, a hundred thousand, over what was it? Almost four hundred thousand, I think. Uh, one, one source said, um, of different alien demon species, and that um, the um, chief god on Earth, I, I can't think it was Kali or, uh, but anyway, he was the blue god. They call him the blue god, and he actually 
went to the moon in Aviana, and there was a battle waged on our moon. So the ancient Vedic texts knew the moon was another object in our solar system, and apparently there was some kind of interstellar war going on, and we were just a colony planet. And apparently the race or races that controlled us withdrew from the Earth at that point. Also, a great deal happened catastrophically on Earth at about the same time, and I think this was a result of that war. You suddenly had a massive um, reduction in the size of the glaciers, a, a sudden rising rapidly of the oceans. Uh, you had earthquakes. Uh, this is about the time when the Great Flood was supposed to have taken place. And if you were just a small coastal village separated without any means of seeing anyone else across the Pacific or the Atlantic or wherever, and suddenly the sea levels were rising like crazy, uh, as much as 400 feet, some say, uh, your entire civilization has gone down the hills. We know that around the world, megalithic structures, stone structures exist. We know that they date back a lot further than we originally thought. And we know that practically overnight, it ceased, not just in one location, but all around the planet. What caused that? Well, here, here's a question. Do you think that like, if there were small like coastal villages and stuff, do you believe that there, there was ever a point where humanity would have been uh, technologically advanced, like do you, believe, do you believe that Atlantis ever existed? Uh, no, I think the human beings were deliberately kept in a slave capacity. Uh, they had, there were different um, levels to society. At the top would be the aliens, the so-called gods. Yeah. They would live in their palaces which we now call temples. They were served by servants, which we now call priests. And by the way, we still have lots of temples around the planet. We call them churches now, among other things. And we still have priesthoods serving God, in them, but God's not there, not physically, in the churches or temples anymore. Are, is this a, a racial memory of the time when we did serve the so-called gods in person? So it does make you wonder. But no, I don't... Uh, one of the things you have to remember is... Uh, overlords of any race do not like their slaves to become intelligent or educated because that breeds rebellion. And by the way, the Vedic texts talk about that during this war. There was a great rebellion by humans. And uh, so even in America, even with the slavery in the South prior to the Civil War, it was a criminal offense to teach a slave to read or write because then they could send messages to each other on paper. Whereas the best way was to keep them isolated and unable to communicate each on their own plantation or wherever. So it is very common for the ruling classes to try to keep the lower classes, if they're enslaved, uh, illiterate. It is to right. their advantage to keep illiterate. I, 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 I feel you on that. That makes a lot of sense. And that, um, but I just want to get your opinion on this because you've you studied this well. I've heard other researchers talk like, you know, deep about the Anunnaki and say, you know, Enlil was obviously against uh, humans, but it, he wanted slay. Enlil wanted slaves, so he had Anki, the geneticist, make slaves. But Anki knew in his heart. This is what other researchers have had said. Anki knew in his heart that he didn't want to make like a non-sentient slave, so that's why he gave us like chakras, so to say, and a uh, pineal gland, and you know, the ability to raise our consciousness to maybe escape this slavery in some way? Do you buy into any of that? Or do you think that's like kind of new agey stuff? I buy into some of it. I do think it crosses over into new age and into a realm where you simply can't, they can't even prove chakras really exist. So how can you, how can you incorporate that into the history of the, of the human race? Unless you're <laughs> sure of that fact. <laughs> yeah, that makes it that man that makes a lot of sense because I'm not new age, but I hear I, I've studied the 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 the, the internet. I love the study of the internet. I tell I tell people this on my on my um on my uh on on every, on every one of my podcasts. They're probably sick of hearing it, but I tell my guests that you know when usually when on my picture you can see behind me I have an Anunnaki genealogy table from when they created us to down to the characters in the Bible. You know, it, it's a guy by the name of Gerald Clark. He passed away. He was like an Anunnaki researcher. He had a number one bestseller. It was called the Anunnaki of Nibiru. And uh, he, you know, he thought they were our enslavers too, but he thought more like Anki and Thoth were more helpful to mankind. And that's what he looked at. He looked at it as like Anki and Thoth might have been helpful more to mankind. 
Me, I don't know. I just, I, 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 and I see you, it seems like you look at the facts. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I like to stick to facts. However, do remember that as far as being forbidden, we have a very ancient history of knowledge being the forbidden fruit, literally, from the Bible. The tree of knowledge was forbidden, not the tree of life. Why was knowledge forbidden to us? And by the way, it isn't just us. The Greeks have the histories of Prometheus, who gave man fire, and the other gods punished him by eternally uh, chaining him to a rock and having uh, vultures peck his vitals out of him over and over for eternity. That was the price he paid for helping mankind. It may have been that Enki was the original father of this particular legend, and I'm not so sure it's a legend in, in a sense that I think... As with any group, there are diverse members, and maybe some didn't like what the others were doing, wanted to handle it differently. I'm not sure. But yes, there's definite evidence that um, history, a very ancient history to the present, knowledge is the forbidden fruit. In fact, to this day, <laughs> there are people who don't think that knowledge is a good idea. They're anti-science, anti-vax, they're... Um, you know, they're the, I, I went to the real school, the School of Hard Knocks. And by the way, that's not to be dismissed. Book learning is not the same as life experience. However, book learning is also necessary as well. The two are needed, life experience and that. But on top of that, you have the history of the serpent. And uh, this, the serpent is has a duality. In the Bible, it was evil and uh Yet uh, the the double certain caduceus is the symbol of modern medicine, and has been for centuries now. So it has both good and bad aspects. There's the so-called brotherhood of the um, uh, serpent. That's a secret clandestine group that has been trying to share ancient knowledge, but the another group, the ruling class of our planet, has been actively um, giving us disinformation about them, saying that they're evil. Knowledge is the forbidden fruit. We shouldn't want to know this stuff. It's not good to know. It will end in our own destruction, blah, blah, blah. Look how apocalyptic our culture is. We believe that something's going to wipe us out. Absolutely. Whether it's a meteor or an asteroid or a gamma ray burst or a sun uh, going um, nova. But it's almost like we want this to happen, almost like it's been bred into us to not want to have knowledge, and that knowledge is a dangerous thing, and we should avoid it. Why is that so embedded in all the civilizations of our planet? That's weird. That, that definitely is weird. I, I don't even know the end. It definitely is. Like, um, But knowledge has definitely been kept from us. It, it, you almost have – I've had a guy come on my show and break down, like, numerology and how the – you know, it, it kind of makes sense that there's, like, a – you know, like the – the uh, what am I trying to think of the the uh, my tongue's twisted the Fibonacci sequence and the flower of life it makes you almost think there's a god because there's kind of like a golden ratio to this planet if I'm making any sense um it you know it it, 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 it least, the golden ratio these could that? all be uh, mathematical constructs if we're in a simulation yes yeah. But it, but it could be a simulation created by a creator, or, I mean, and then it, um, an ultimate creator. Who knows? You know, I, I'm, I'm playing. Or it could be created by a cosmic programmer. Yeah. Some vast, cool intellect from the far future or from outside of our universe. We may be resident on some uh, interstellar computer. We may. Uh, uh, I mean, the evidence right now, uh, scientists originally said we had about a 33 percent chance of existing in a simulation. Now they've upped it to 50, and one scientist just came out this week and said, no, it's 100%. It's, it's 100% because, as I was telling you before the show, the only artifact that would exist inside a simulation, because everything is simulated, the only thing that they couldn't get around is the processing speed of the simulation. That would be the speed that it, we're running at. And we do seem to have that particular uh, thing in our universe is called the speed of light, and it's a constant. It seems to be an arbitrary number. We don't know why, but there it is. And by the way, whether you're standing still on a bicycle or on a rocket, uh, the speed of light always exists at 186,000 miles per second, or three approximately, uh, three, like, what is it, 3,000 kilometers per second? Anyway, I only know it in miles. But um, the point, or seven and a half times, 
uh, around the Earth in a second. Some say nine, but it's the ballpark. But in any case, it's always that speed, whether you're at rest or, or going fast or just moving along at a snail's pace. And we can't figure out why that is. Why is the speed of light always constant in relation to us, no matter how fast we're moving? Even if we're moving at nine-tenths the speed of light, the speed of light is still going to be 186,000 miles faster than what we're doing. Uh, you can yeah. be on a train, a plane, or a rocket, and it's still stand. So this scientist believes that it is the processing speed that our simulation is running at. So and another... Another interesting thing is, I don't know if you knew this, is that we only see only 5%, I think it's 5%, but we're missing about 95% of the electromagnetic light spectrum, which means, you know, that could be the reason why we're not seeing a lot of times UFOs or even Bigfoot or, um, I, I don't know, that could, that stuff could all be interdimensional too, I, I don't know, or that could be, if it's a program... Okay. As, as well, we've got cloaking devices now, and, and a lot of our planes and ships are um, using cloaking capabilities. I mean, the average bomber jet now has the signature of a goose, a uh, radar signature of a goose. So we're getting pretty good at cloaking ourselves. So why couldn't alien craft be cloaked as well? And it only showed up during, a, a, say, during a lightning storm or some kind of effect like that. But yes, we only see a very narrow portion of the spectrum. So I'm uh, wondering what's uh, out there that can't be seen. You know, what, what could we well, possibly? Uh, I was going to say, get a get a, a pair of night vision goggles and look up at the night sky sometime. Oh, would be amazing. Well, that, it would... that explains it all. Yeah, that, then we'd be seeing a bunch of you, probably a bunch of a lot of UFOs. And you know, um, I, I know like uh, people can see. Uh, I know this guy I just had on my show, Michael Lynch. He can see spirits, or you know, like when when I mean, he's basically showed me that orbs are consciousness, possibly. He, this is possibly. He's not saying for sure, but he thinks orbs are, you know, he's been a ghost investigator for years, and he thinks he has orbs on film, and he showed me them before we did the show. He didn't do. He didn't show them on the show, but he showed me them, and he was like, you know, orbs can be consciousness of a human, an animal, and, um, you know, I thought that was interesting, but, um, you know, because it's weird, because when we die, we go to this just other dimension it seems like where you know we're we're still here and uh you know if you listen to evps and stuff i'm real into the after death what happens when we die theory or you know because i you know like if you listen to evps it seems like these things are trying to speak they use it seems like they're trying to use energy to speak through an evp but they can only get like one sentence out what are your thoughts on that kind of stuff and the, like the, like after death and evps and all that well i the uh, guest you had on was uh, stretching it a bit. Um, I, again, I like evidence. I like facts. You can not You can build any castle out of sand that you want, but it'll just be made out of sand or castles in the air. You've got to have facts to base your hypotheses on. Now, he sees orbs. Great. He says they're spirits. Are they? Where's his proof? Has he talked to them? Have they? Has he recorded them? Has he, you know... Uh, yeah, he he's recorded them with a uh, the camera where he's he's showing their energy signature, and he said he's seen like an orb turn into like a like a like project uh, a man's body. He like that that's the part I left out. Like he said he's actually seen like an orb like uh, also like like project into a man's body like. You know, uh, at one point he said somehow the, the, the universe remembers what a person looked like at a certain point, which would, would go along with the simulation theory because the the, the, the computer would remember at what you looked at like when you were alive at some point, which, which is a stretch. That's a very stretch for far from the imagination, but I don't know. That's what kind of what we talked about. It's a, it's a bit too much of a stretch for me. I'm not saying that orbs aren't consciousness. Uh, I've seen some orbs. I, I investigate the paranormal. I've been to haunted mansions, went up in Ohio, southern Ohio, uh, for Alien Skin magazine, spent a week in there exploring. Um, you, you can make any claims you want, and you can be quite, not you, but one, can make any claims they want and be quite sincere about their beliefs. But they are just beliefs without facts. Faith is having a, a, a belief in something and a belief is something that cannot be proven. You, you must just believe. 
Now, you can believe orbs are that, or, you could, or they could be ball lightning, or they could be some other physical manifestation. Um, we have uh, orbs here in North Carolina that float up off over a mountain ridge, uh, the Brown Mountain Lights, famous for centuries. Uh, National Geographic has talked about it. The U.S. Uh, Geographical uh, Survey noticed it. They were first noticed by um, white people in seventeen late 1700s, doing a survey of the area. The uh, Native Americans had already talked about it and, 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 and known of them for centuries. They thought they were the lights of uh, maidens carrying lamps looking for their lost braves. Uh, the local people in Morganton think it's the um, ghosts of a woman that was executed there. I've actually photographed them. I know they don't seem to be subject to wind. They are not swamp gas because they come up off of a mountain ridge, not a valley where there's a swamp. There's no swamp on a ridge. And um, they go straight up. And that day, it was blowing hard, up to 40 miles per hour. It was autumn. There were no leaves on the trees. And it was a fierce wind blowing, although it was clear. These things went straight up. They weren't balloons. They weren't drones. In fact, at the time I did this, drones were, n were not hardly available at all. And they weren't helicopters and they weren't planes. And I don't know what they were. But they are so common that there's even a turnout on the state highway and a state sign that says viewing point for Brown Mountain Lights. They have um, been talked about in um, songs. There's songs about them, books about them. They even were in an episode along with Bigfoot of um, X-Files. So these things are well known. Are they spirits of dead people? Are they UFOs? Are they some kind of... Uh, natural phenomena i don't know and not knowing i can't say well can i ask you this because i'm really interested in this like if you're doing your research on the paranormal did you ever interact with any ghosts or uh, afterlife intelligence um i've been to a couple seances uh i have done ghost hunting um uh, i find it I, I personally think there might be a life after death if you want to know the truth and I'm writing a book about it right now called Quantum Immortality. There's even some scientific evidence these days to support the idea of an afterlife. But I'm not sure that a lot of what these ghost I mean, the ghost hunters has been on TV for years now. Have they ever actually produced any evidence of any clarity whatsoever about ghosts? No. All of down in the one says, oh, I felt a cold spot. Oh, it was really cold just then. Or I heard a noise. We don't see it. We don't feel it. And we don't hear it. So you have to take their word for it. And you know how these reality TV shows are. If nothing's happening, the producers make something happen. Yeah. So I don't find them very, very well. Um, my editor at Alien Skin Magazine did manage to record, um, uh, electronically record some uh, things at a graveyard. And one of them clearly sounds like someone saying, please help me. I mean, it's clear enough where I think that's actually what they're saying, and it is a voice, and yet I was there with her, and we heard absolutely nothing at the time. So could there be life after death? Yes. Could there be ghosts? Yes. Um, and in fact, everything is, is really ghosts. You know, you're made up of atoms. The atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and those are made up of quarks. Now, 99.9999999% of an atom is absolute nothing. It's vacuum. It's space. Now, you take all those atoms and you put them together in the human body, and that means that you are 99.9999999% nothing. And every desk and everything else is it's only the strong nuclear force. I think it's the strong nuclear force that keeps us um, from passing our hand through something because it repels and therefore a hand won't go through a wall and vice versa, not easily. And uh, so if you want to know, can a ghost walk through another ghost? Apparently not, because in a real sense, we're nothing. Even that little tiny bit of matter that does make us up uh, actually isn't matter at all. It's according to uh, physicists, it's energy. It's, it's particles, string particles of energy. So we're not solid at all. We are ghosts walking through a ghost world, and one ghost seems pretty much solid to another ghost, apparently, because we don't walk through each other. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's where it comes down to, like, if you believe, like, if you believe that we have, like, a, a that our consciousness comes from somewhere else, and that it's put into us, and it acts as some kind of, uh, you know, that it's part of a collective consciousness, and like I said, this is just a belief, 
you know, um, who knows, you know, because if we're made up of atoms and water and that's, you know, basically nothing, where's our intelligence come? Where, like who put together a human body that's put together so perfectly that it can function and that we can reproduce? It's, it's, you know, I don't have. Well, an... again about that, an octopus can reproduce quite well too. So can an earthworm. It's, uh, life is a marvelous, wonderful mechanism, but it's hardly unique to human beings. And also, uh, even though uh, we can think um, it may be a logical outgrowth, it seems that the more um, advanced a species is, the closer they are to consciousness. There's no doubt that cats and dogs are partially, at least, self-aware. Apes are even more so. They even have a sense of humor. So is it just a scaling thing? The more complex the organism becomes, the more likely it is to become intelligent and self-aware? It would seem so, because we don't think earthworms and stuff have much sense of self-awareness, but we do think dogs, cats, goats, horses, and apes do, and a lot of birds as well. So um, there is reason to believe that uh, it may just be a scaling up of what the lesser creatures have to the point where suddenly self-awareness becomes consciousness, and we are asking about ourselves in the universe as a result. Another theory is that the human mind is quantum in nature. The brain is the material part, and the mind is the quantum wave part. It is in a state of probabilities. And also there's some evidence to suppose, physical evidence by uh, neurosurgeons, that say we have microtubules in our brain, and that uh, when we die, the electrical energy in our brain seems to drain out through these microtubules. Now, the thing is, these microtubules seem to behave in a quantum way. And one neurosurgeon said it could be that the human consciousness drains out of the body and into the universe at large in some fashion or other. But there's, there is residual electrical activity after a human dies, and it'll persist for several minutes, but it drains out of these microtubules, which they think function in a quantum level way. So there you go. So what you, would you, explain you, reincarnation, or is that just a belief? No, the, um, again, I don't know the answers to everything, but I do know this. Reincarnation, I don't know if it's true or not, but there seems to be an, a reasonable amount of evidence to suggest that it might just be true. Yeah, I do too. I believe it. I just wanted to get your opinion, and I want the audience to hear what you have to say, because I like to get every guest's different opinion. Even if I, if I agree or disagree, I'm not, I just want to hear it. I want to hear what you have to say, because it's, it's very interesting. But go, uh, go ahead, I'm well, sorry. Oh, no, I, it's just that I like to base it on facts. And, and, and my belief in reincarnation to a certain degree, it, uh, first of all, I hate the word believe. B believe is having faith in something which cannot be proven. So yeah. I don't believe in you. Uh, for me, UFOs are real. The evidence is in. They exist. Our government has released videos of it a lot in the last year. And the countless reports of it uh, all over the planet, Every year, it's been going up in numbers. I think UFOs exist. What they are, I'm not sure, but I think they actually exist. I don't believe in UFOs any more than I believe in the Easter Bunny or uh, the Tooth Fairy, but I think that they actually exist, and I think this way about other things as well. But didn't with they, reincarnation, if we're in a, oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry about reincarnation. You know, but I to be go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I'm done. You go ahead. I was saying, I, I'm going to get into reincarnation, but I want to get into your book, Deadly UFOs, because you have some physical proof that, um, which I do too, but I want my audience to hear what you have to say about deadly UFOs, because it's very intriguing. Yeah, I give a lot of presentations, including the Space and Sky Conference back in 2017 in Washington, D.C., and um, I get some very angry people at me in the audience sometimes, and oddly enough, and I don't know why it is, they're usually women. They want to think of aliens as their space brothers. And the whole point of my presentation was, based on that book, was I don't think they are. Whoever they are, whatever they are, they don't seem to, none of be blunt here, they don't seem to give a damn about us at all. Yeah. They, um, they damage our property. They injure us. They make us sick. They kill us. And people think, oh, well, that's just the odd person that's been killed by an accidental thing with a UFO. Uh-uh. Lots of people have died over the last century. Lots of people. And in some pretty now, are, horrible ways. Are we talking about mutilations or are we just talking about like in general accidents or all of the above? 
We're talking about all of the above. There was the case of a man in, uh, in Brazil in the late 80s. This didn't come out till the 90s when the coroner's photographs were finally posted on the Internet. And he admitted that, yes, they don't know what happened. But this man's body was found by a reservoir near San Paulo in Brazil. His body had had the eyes removed, part of the lower jaw, his tongue, his rectum had been excised. There were tiny holes in his armpits and in his stomach, and his internal organs had been taken out. There was no blood in the body, but there was no blood on the grass. He was as thoroughly mutilated as any cow or horse would be in these situations. Now, here's the truly horrible part. When they did the autopsy, they checked the brain. The brain showed the effects of incredible trauma, a tremendous fear, and apparently pain. The man had an agonized expression <clears throat> on his face when they found him. They could find nothing in his body that would have acted as an anesthetic while all this had happened to him. Apparently, he had been paralyzed in some fashion because there was no sign of resistance, no bruises on him. But he was apparently awake through the whole process and couldn't, simply couldn't move as they did all of this to him. Now, if that isn't a truly horrific thing to have happen to a human being, I don't know what is. Yeah, that's 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 sickening. Yeah, that's and uh, supposedly that ha that's happened more than once, you know, with the I mean, I, I know a guy and he ties aliens to adrenochrome and, you know, he has good theories. And um, I, I don't know. It's, it's it, again, it's it's a belief, though. It comes. Uh, there, uh, there's no factual. There's no fact saying that they're they're taking humans and adrenochroming them. But people are disappearing. You would agree with that, though, right? Yes, and I've actually worked the numbers, and my numbers are – I'm more conservative than the American FBI. The American FBI says some 60,000 people a year in the United States go missing permanently. Now, these are not people who are murdered or have been kidnapped who just or just ran away from home and wanted to start a new life so under a new name somewhere else. Those are pretty much accounted for and taken out of the numbers. But 60,000 Americans a year are disappearing permanently, and a lot of them are disappearing from our national and state parks. On top of this, Alaska, over a 15-year span, had 7% of its population disappear permanently. 7%! That's an enormous number. Yeah, an enormous it is. Percent. And it's referred to as the Alaska Triangle because of all these permanent disappearances. And to this day, they haven't been found. Uh, I'd love to interview so someone from up there and get their opinion on what they think is going on. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, I, I don't know anybody from Alaska. I don't, I've never seen anybody talk and interview anybody from there to get their opinion as to what they think might be going on. You know, I mean, it's very weird, though. Um, that's that's definitely weird. I mean, and then you have, and, so you have the Alaska Triangle, the national parks. Um, I don't know if these are like the UFO hunting grounds or what. Uh I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing it around the world. Australia has up to 30,000 people who disappear every year. Now, this is a small country. Its population is barely bigger than the state of New York's, and it's a country the size of the United States, and yet 30,000 people a year are disappearing. They've only got about 26 million people total. So that's an enormous number, and they're disappearing permanently. It's an island continent. Where are they going? What was happening to them? They're never heard from again. All these countries that are, are fairly well-developed keep these statistics. A lot of the underdeveloped countries don't. But if every country is experiencing these levels of disappearances, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people every single year who simply vanish. And by the way, it's not new. It dates back to the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. They talk about people who disappeared, including a general that just simply vanished, never seen again. Wow. Oh, and by the way, the Romans... Romans believed in haunted houses. They referred to certain houses in Rome as being sick and unsafe to live in because of an evil presence that existed there. So even the haunting idea goes way back in time, too. But, yeah, I like to get evidence from a lot of different sources to kind of back my conclusions. I do form theories, but my theories usually are based on facts. Oh, wait, can, and, can you tell my, my, uh, my, my stories, uh, your, the, the couple of stories I heard? I was preparing for this podcast, and I heard you talk about um, you know, Alexander Great and the siege of the siege of the Tyre. I loved it. I loved hearing stories about Alexander the Great. I heard that there's a UFO, UFO story involved with that. Could you tell it? Sure. Alexander the Great was, of course, the world's greatest conqueror. He made it right to the border of India. Now, as he's preparing to cross the Indus River, from whence India kind of gets its name, 
he they were his troops were buzzed by what he referred to as silver flying shields. Now, do remember that different cultures in different times describe things differently because they didn't have cups and saucers, so they didn't call them flying saucers. What they had that looked like it were polished metal shields. So that's what they compared them to. But these flying shields buzzed their troops, um, frightened the people, scattered them, and uh, maddened the war elephants to the point where they stampeded. Uh, now, they did manage to regroup, and by the way, these things supposedly then plunged into the river and uh, disappeared. So there's some evidence for that below water thing that's been going on with UFOs lately. But um, the troops did rally, and they did cross the river, but they didn't go far. The uh, troops, were, from that point forward, were in a state of rebellion and felt the gods were against them. And that was as far as Alexander the Great ever got in spreading his empire to the east. So he returned to the West, and um, in what is now Lebanon, I believe, it was the yeah, city it's of Lebanon. Tyre. Well, yeah, because I'm part yeah. Lebanese. Like, I know the, I'm, I've never been, I'm totally American, but I just did my research on the area because I'm, I'm Greek and Lebanese, so I know a lot about the areas over there. Well, not a lot, but I know, I know a little bit about history and stuff, yeah. But go ahead, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, uh, you, you, you helped uh, make sure I was saying the right thing. Luckily, I was, <laughs> mm -hmm. thanks to you. Uh, uh, yeah, so this city of Tyre, this ancient city, was walled. And uh, Alexander the Great and his troops were having a heck of a time trying to breach it. And again, his men were pretty fed up, and they were now pretty close to home as the crow flies, and they wanted to head back to Macedonia. When suddenly, these flying silver shields appeared and shot some sort of ray down that demolished one of the walls of the city. And so Alexander the Great was able to take the city, invade and take the city. Now, that was his personal historian who recorded this. Is it true? Well, the historian says it's true. Who knows? But it's an odd thing for an historian to say from that ancient time, if it isn't true. But um, apparently the aliens don't mind changing history or directing the flow of it. They apparently wanted to stop him from conquering all of India, but they wanted him to defeat Tyre and, and uh, consolidate his hold in the West. And, of course, when he did that by taking Tyre, he then controlled all of the Middle East, northern Africa, southern Europe, uh, over almost to Italy, and um, he set up the pan-Hellenic civilization to which the later pharaohs, including Cleopatra, were members of, the Ptolemies. Their yeah, because Ptolemy was a part of his, uh, the first Ptolemy was part of his um, army, and he, he, he gave he gave Ptolemy that section of Egypt to rule. So Ptolemy ruled uh, after Alexander died, Ptolemy was given Egypt to rule over, and I know that part of history. I know the Alexander story pretty well. And then, and, and, and then as, as it goes on, there was like Ptolemy 1, 2, 3, right? Am I correct about that? Uh, there were a number. Yeah, they were all pharaohs. And, they, and the last one, of course, was Cleopatra and her brother. But his, her brother died before she did. Cause she hadn't killed, but, um, or, you know, indirectly, but she did. And, then, of course, she was the last to die with Mark Anthony. So um, that kind of ended all of that. The Ptolemies were finally gone. But it also meant that for quite a long time, the civilization of the West was pan-Hellenic. It absorbed all of the, the Grecian pan-Hellenic ideals and ideas. And Rome, uh, when it conquered Greece later, absorbed it completely. And Rome became very much a Pan-Hellenic culture as well. So our entire Western civilization is based on Alexander the Great's conquering of that region. And, and here's, so the, here's the way, something that makes me think, think of something. It makes me think, you know, Persia was a really older empire at that time. You know, that was close to where, that was close to Persia, as close to Iraq, which was Samaria which is supposedly where the Anunnaki were. Um, do you think there could have been gods in, in Greece or in gods in favor of Alexander the Great? This is all speculation, uh, you know, that wanted him to conquer and erase that uh, history that was in Persia, which would have been actually Marduk's territory. Uh, that Because Marduk was the god of Babylon. Um, so that's just a little bit of speculation. What do you think about that? Well, okay, you got to be careful about time frames here because the Sumerians came way, way before, thousands of years before um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, Alexander. no, but what I'm saying is, you know, they, do you think that could have been them trying to erase the, the Persian history? Because it seems like when Rome came, Rome erased, Rome burned down the Library of Alexandria. So, so you see what I'm saying? Like, as cultures came, like, when Greece went into Persia, they rewrote the history because they wanted everybody to think that they were the first doing everything. And then when Rome came, they really messed up the history, and they, they wanted the, the Roman history to be written about everything. So you have to, like, dig deep, and that's how when we that's how now we recently found out about the Sumerian tablets. And that's why I was just thinking, do you think that was possibly – them not wanting us to know our history does that make sense uh it could be because the library of alexandria was the biggest repository of knowledge in the ancient world in fact the destruction of the library by some historians says it set back civilizations by a thousand years by losing that yeah and there was supposedly were things and all sorts of information stored there now whether the romans actually destroyed the library that's become a, a moot point here in the last two, 10 years or so there are a lot of um, people who say, no, they didn't destroy it. Uh, and, if, and if they did, it was strictly by accident that a fire spread and, and went to the library. But it wasn't on purpose that the Romans weren't trying to deliberately destroy the Library of Alexandria because it was one of the wonders of the world. And it held a great deal of knowledge that they could have used, especially the maps. Yeah. Because no ship could or in Alexandria without surrendering their maps to the library to be copied. That's, that's pretty interesting. I mean, I, I just always have a feeling that they're always trying to cover up history. Like, you know, like even with uh, like today's Easter and Christianity, when you think about Christianity, um, you know, Christianity was started by Constantinople. Um, he moved the empire of Rome to Turkey and Constantinople because Rome was uh, no longer, uh, it could no longer, and they got this idea to revamp the Roman empire and call it Christianity. Meanwhile, there could have been this figure named Jesus that really existed, and and he, you know, could have been a really special person, but they might have copied some of the characteristics of Jesus from other people like Krishna, Mithra, Dionysus, and Horus. They all had similar char characteristics to, to Jesus. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, first of all, the um, Roman Empire under Emperor Constantine moved to um, Constantinople, which he named after himself. Nice guy. Um, I guess because he could. And he yeah. converted. <laughs> but he did keep the Eastern Roman Empire alive for quite a while. Of course, it kind of um, collapsed in the 5th century, not too long after the Roman Empire fell. And although it survived after that, it was never as strong as it was prior to that because of the... Um, the year 536, when there was no sun in the sky to speak of, and there was cold, and there was famine, and then plagues came because because of all that famine and people's reduced ability to ward off disease. And the plague of Justinian, under the emperor Justinian, uh, they think killed over 50 million people. Oh, wow. So that pretty much weakened the power of, uh, yeah, of the Byzantine Empire forever. They just, um, they still existed, they still had power, they were still wealthy, but they were already at that point forward. They were in decline. So, um, and what? And what and, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, oh, you go it, ahead. <laughs> it, it gets me back to these bloodline kings. Like, do you think that the Anunnaki created? I mean, if you look at the work of like David Icke, his early stuff, David Icke traced the Sumerian kings to um, all the way to British rulers, and he thought that that was a bloodline. I mean, he traced it through. Uh, he, he, it went, he, he, there, there's been a couple people who've read this, and it's pretty interesting to trace it. It went from Sumeria, which was Iraq, down to uh, Saudi Arabia. Then it goes over into the Caucasus Mountains. Then it, it somehow ends up in France as the Merovingians. And then that goes over into London. And then somehow from there, every United States president is linked to uh, one of the kings in England. And I might be really reaching right now, but it's still really interesting. <laughs> have you heard that before? There is another aspect to that. Yes, I have heard about it before. And there's another aspect to that that I find quite weird. Did you know the majority of our American presidents since we began testing them, and this dates back over a century now, are RH negative. 
and that most of the members of the royal families of Europe are Rh negative. And the Rh negative is a recessive gene. It, it's, um, if a mother is one positive and the child's negative, the child or the mother or both often don't survive until modern medicine made it possible where they could. So this was a self-destructive gene that should have weeded itself out of the population a long, long time ago, long before we came up with medical ways of stopping it from killing people. I happen to be B-negative. And there are groups on the Internet, check it out uh, after this, that if you are Rh negative, you're considered to be descended directly from the uh, um, Anunnaki. Really? That they tinkered with humans and used some of their own genes, and that one of the things they tinkered with was, yeah. And by the way, Rh stands for rhesus factor. Monkeys have the um, uh, Rh uh, positive, and most humans have it. Only around 11 to 15 percent of humans worldwide have the Rh negative gene. And as I said, it's pretty self-destructive when you mix it with the positive. It's only, and we also have other traits as well. We're often left-handed. We often have above, uh, above average IQs. Um, I know for a fact I do because I was a member of Mensa at one point. But, um, uh, and we often have blue eyes and uh, other characteristics. So, and uh, most people in Asia and Africa don't have it. It, only seems to, it seems to have suddenly sprung into existence somewhere in Middle Europe and um, has gone on from there. And no one knows why, and no one knows why it continued. If you have a gene that when you mix it with 95% of the population or 90%, it kills them. Yeah. Then it should have burned itself out a long, long time ago. But it hasn't. It still persists. And isn't it odd that most of the members of the royal family of England and many of the members of the royal houses of Europe and most of the presidents of the United States are Rh negative? Just an odd coincidence. It's, they, they breed those bloodlines together, it seems like. It seems like they, 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 they stay strict, the bloodlines. I mean, even Obama, I heard, was, I mean, this is pretty conspiratorial, but I even heard Obama was related to the Bushes somehow. I don't know if you ever heard that. Yeah, actually I have. And most of the presidents, even, even George Washington was a distant cousin of Mad King George. Uh, these royal houses are all interconnected. Queen Victoria's kids, uh, she had so many. Uh, they were on every royal throne in Europe. The uh, wife of um, the Tsar, Alexander, his wife, uh, I mean, Nic Nicholas, his wife, um, uh, Alexandria, was a uh, granddaughter of Queen Elizabeth, I mean, Queen Victoria. <coughs> so, um, and they all had um, suffered from hemophilia, another recessive gene inbred. But... Uh, oh. Well, I, 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 we've been going for a long time. Do you want to cap off real quick with a couple facts about some moon mysteries, if you don't mind? Because, like, I just want to hear about it. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want, I don't want to take too long of your day. But this has been an excellent discussion, man. I think this has been one of the best podcasts I've done in a long time. I mean, I think people are going to be so interested with this, with the, the stuff that we talked about. I mean, I really think it's it, it has been like golden, but um. I, I, I didn't, I, I, I thought the fact you brought up about the moon are interesting. I mean, do you come to a conclusion that you think there are aliens on the moon or what do you, what are your thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the evidence is significant. I think there's a high probability that aliens are on the moon or were on the moon and probably still are. Uh, they seem to be in space around earth. They seem to follow our uh, Apollo uh, missions to the moon and, um, Apparently, there's even some reason to believe that they were on the moon when the first Apollo 11 landed there, and we're watching them as they landed. There are reports that um, uh, Armstrong said there's two of them sitting on the ridge, meaning ships, and they appear to be watching us. I uh, also saw it, I, it's completely disappeared. It's been a number of years now, but I saw it live on television, so I can directly say this is true. The, um, there was a commander, it was a woman, of a space shuttle in Earth orbit. And at one point, she's floating in the cabin, and she's sort of looking out the window, and she goes, oh, there's that alien spaceship again. Then silence. She's still there, she's still floating, and she's still talking. You can see her mouth moving, but you can't hear anything. They switched her over to a private channel. 
So I think there's definite evidence for that. Also, the moon is a very weird place. One scientist said it's easier to theorize that the moon doesn't exist at all than to try to explain it. It's too big for a planet our size. We don't know how it got into its present orbit. We don't know where it, the damn thing came from. Some people say it came from the Earth itself when the planet Theia impacted the Earth. Yet we've brought rocks back from the, room and uh, from the moon, and their isotopic signatures show that they mirror Earth's mantle. There, if another planet struck ours, there should be rocks on the moon that had that isotopic signature. Theia was the planet that supposedly impacted the moon. So we don't know quite why. We don't know why there are vast lava areas on the side facing the Earth, but none on the far side of the moon. We don't know why there's so much helium-3 on the moon. It's almost non-existent on Earth, hard to come by. Yet the moon has tons and tons and tons of it. Um, the moon also has, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, but the, 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 I think it was, I'm going to say neutronium-237. may have that wrong. But... Um, it, it's a, a fast decaying isotope, radioactive isotope. It decays into like um, uranium and lead very quickly. It's uh, unstable. When I say very quickly, it takes about two and a half million years. On Earth, it's all disappeared over four and a half billion years. It's just completely gone on Earth. We have to create it in um, atomic accelerators to make it. But uh, on the moon, it exists. And it shouldn't because the moon is supposedly nearly or older than Earth. And if it is, the neutronium on the moon should have gone too, but it didn't. There's also titanium there. There's um, other, uh, and, and then the top three layers of the soil on the moon are reversed, with the densest being on top, and then the lighter layers underneath that, which is in direct contradiction to everything we know about geology. You take a bunch of dirt, put it in a glass, shake it up, and let it settle out, and you'll see layers. The densest layers, the pebbles are on the bottom. The lighter layers, the, the, the silt uh, is on the top. But on the moon, it's reversed as if it had been pumped out from the inside of the moon. Also, the, the large craters on the moon are very shallow. They should be very deep, but they're not. The small craters are their normal depth. Two scientists from the Soviet Union, they belong to the Soviet uh, Academy of Sciences. They're the ones who came up with the spaceship moon theory to try to explain all this. And by the way, the density of the moon is wrong, too. It's too light for its size. There's not enough density. It, one scientist said this raises the uh, alarming idea that the center of the moon might be hollow. You have to account for that missing mass somehow. Also, NASA commissioned a report on transient lunar phenomena in the 60s. It dated back 500 years when uh, telescopes first started being used. They wanted fairly reliable observations. And in those observations, they found that people around the world, in Europe, America, and elsewhere, when they trained their telescopes on the moon, they saw blinks flashing lights, what they thought were volcanoes. There are no volcanoes on the moon. They're supposedly all extinct and have been for uh, millions and millions and millions of years, maybe billions. Um, they found, they saw lightning. They saw tracks. They saw moving objects. And these weren't just flash in the pans. Some of these things went on, persisted for months, and were noted by several scientists in several locations around the Earth, astronomers at the time. Wow. And some very famous it's known as these Copernicus and uh, Tycho Brahe and, and other famous astronomers noted these things. So, And it continues today. Even now, we have uh, streaks, flashes, uh, myths, blue lights, uh, beacons, things all, all the time on the moon. In fact, one crater has seen so many blue lights in it and so many blue myths that it uh, is referred to as the blue gem by scientists. And that's the Aristarchus Crater. Someone measured wow. the color of time, and they said it matched that of a fusion reactor. So there you go. Wow. Well, this has been great, man. Um, do you want to tell everybody where they can get your books and stuff, like, and your website? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, don't even worry about my website. It's just robshelsky.blogspot.com. But just go to um, Amazon Kindle. All my books are there. You can get them in print. You can get them in Kindle. If you like them in other formats, you can go to Smashwords, or you can go to Permuted Press, or you can even go to Simon & Schuster. I have books with them as well, including one of my latest ones, Invader Moon. So and I will uh, say they're very relatively priced. I mean, you, I, I, mean, I think they're, they're priced at like $2.99 for a Kindle version. I mean, that's cheaper than a cup of coffee, literally. So, I mean, I mean and you're getting good, great information. So... That's a, I think that's pretty amazing that you let them price that low. So, I mean, that's cool that you just want to get the information out there. 
Yeah, that is basically it. I research the stuff. I decide to write a book about it to sort of bring it all together and get, also pro, not promote my theories, but at least put them forward. And I find that um, if you overprice books, you might make money, but you'll sell fewer. And I want the knowledge out there. I want people to read the stuff, think about it for themselves, and come up with their own conclusions. Yeah, that, and 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 that's that's why that's why I thought this podcast was one of the best I've done because I you know this really made me think. Um, th- thank you again so much for doing this. Uh, I really appreciate it. Oh, no problem. I really enjoyed it. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Definitely. I'll be in touch in the future. Thanks, Rob. You have a good night. You too. Thank you.